All right, we have the privilege of having a guest speaker with us today. And in even better news, we are staying in the book of Acts. You know, I, I get a connect card filled out every week almost saying, keep preaching Acts. Every week, there's somebody that puts that. <laughs> Actually, that's nobody, so... Uh, Laura Taro is with us today, and Laura is a church planter in the St. Charles area in the uh, western suburbs. Uh, she is a fellow ECC church planter. She graduated from Wheaton College in 1997. Uh, she has a Master's of Divinity from Northern Seminary. Uh, she is licensed in the Evangelical Church, church and Evangelical Covenant Church going on to or ordination this summer uh, as well. She planted uh, in 2022, just a couple of years ago, so she's a little bit uh, behind us, so their church is just a couple of years old. Now, I thought we were pretty awesome as a church because we are in the same vicinity as a donut shop, okay? Like, just right over here, there is downstate donuts. So you can come into church and grab yourself a donut and come on in. Laura has one-upped us. She has planted a church inside of a donut shop. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Her and her husband, Jeff, who is here today, have been married since 2001. They have two teenagers. Uh, what I hear about what is happening in St. Charles, we've sat down a couple of times. It's amazing. God is doing great things through her as this young church is being planted. It is a privilege and honor to have her here to share with us a little bit about the church and bring the word of God. So would you warmly welcome Laura as she comes to share God's word with us today. Jeremy. Um, so good to be with you all this morning. I'm excited to be in Uptown. It is a beautiful summer day. We were driving in on Lakeshore Drive. I was like, oh, Chicago in the summer. This is so wonderful. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about our donut church. We do meet in a donut shop. We meet at tables and chairs um, around the room, and there's a lot of discussion time. There's a lot of interaction. Um, Jeff and I planted the church about two years ago. We had, you know, with church plants, there's lead up time, there's gathering. So people always ask me, how old is the church? We've been meeting weekly for worship for a year and a half, a little over a year and a half. But there's a whole, at least a year, of gathering people, raising funds, teaching people, finding a location, doing all the work to move in. Um, and so that's where we're at. Um, we are behind you, so it's fun to come see another church plant that's a little bit older, a little bit further down the road, um, a little more formal. Jeff and I are taking notes. We were talking um, at several points this morning already about, oh, look how they do that. Look how they do the children's um, offering. That's so wonderful. I love that. So we're stealing all kinds of ideas from you. So I just want to be upfront about that at the very beginning. Um, I was so grateful to Jeremy for this opportunity. It's always fun uh, for us to visit churches and to learn from you. Um, I'm glad that you guys are doing a series on Acts. We actually, after... Um, uh, Pentecost did a series on uh, the book of Acts. So we've been in similar spaces, which is beautiful as a church plant to talk about the birth of the church and to track um, what happened in the development of the very first church and how they established themselves and how God regularly shows up and does the unexpected. So that's what we're talking about this morning that God sometimes asks us to do the unexpected, and when he does, we really want him to be clear about the specifics. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about my process of church planting, because I have to be honest, I was a little bit reluctant about the process when I first started. So I grew up in a denomination that did not ordain women. So for me, even having an imagination of a woman being a pastor was a real big hurdle from the very start. So God was very gracious with me and grew my imagination over time for what that could look like and what it might mean for me. But sometimes, and I don't know how long you've been walking with Jesus, but sometimes God is more literal 
and more um, in my face to really get my attention. Sometimes he's subtle, but sometimes he's very direct. So that's the story I want to tell you. You see, when God first called me to plant a church, I was at home on my couch, folding laundry, minding my own business. <laughs> and that's when I heard God tell me he wanted me to start a church. And I started laughing out loud. Like, that was my honest reaction. I'm like, I don't know what's happening. I don't know if this is the voice of God, but that's ridiculous. But then I remembered what happens to people in scripture when they laugh at God's call. And I thought, ooh, that's dangerous. So I said to God, I will do this if this is from you, but you are going to have to be very clear and confirm this for me because this seems crazy. I told God, I have no idea how to start a church and I'm not at all sure I'm the right person for the job. So if this is what you want me to do, you are going to have to make sure that I know this is from you. Now at the time, I was working as a freelance proofreader for a variety of Christian publishers and a lot of times, I would say yes to a contract without knowing what the subject matter of the book was about. So I had recently, around this time, said yes to a book. I was expecting it to arrive in, you know, in a package on my front porch. And so a book came within two weeks of this conversation with God. I went out to my porch, picked up the box, took it into my office, opened it up, and I'm not making this up. It was a manual, a how-to guide on how to plant a church. And I started laughing again. I said, okay, God, I hear you. I hear you loud and clear, um, but I'm going to need more direction. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I'm very honest with God. So at the time, Jeff and I started looking for a denomination. I was like, okay, my job is to be faithful and obedient, so we're going to start this process. So we went looking for a denomination that would allow me to plant a church. So Jeff and I came up with a list. We had about five things we were looking for in a church and in a denomination to align ourselves with for the process of planting a church. So here are the five things that we came up with that were on our list. I think there were five. A church that valued scripture and was clear about the gospel of the risen Christ, because that's a non-negotiable for me. A church that ordained women, because, yeah. Um, <laughs> And then a denomination or a church that was committed to planting new churches and doing the work of evangelism. And I told Jeff, it's kind of a joke, like bonus points if they talk openly about the social justice aspect of the gospel. We had spent many years in churches that hinted about those things, that kind of alluded to those things, but rarely did they speak openly. And I said, that would just be nice. Okay. So we had our list, we started visiting churches, and we had this routine. My kids were in middle school at the time where we would drag them to these churches. Um, we would attend, we would kind of look through the material to see if they aligned with our little list that we had. Um, and then I would call the pastor. I was in school at the time and I would say, I'm an MDiv student. Um, I'm studying to be a pastor. I need to do an internship, um, but I'm looking to start a church. And so I, would, I sat down with all these pastors, I had all these conversations, we vis visited all these churches. This was in the spring of 2020, like January, February. This is when we were doing this. So you can see where we're going. The first Sunday we visited a covenant church in Batavia, Illinois. And while we were there, this was in March of 2020, they had a female pastoral intern get up and talk about evangelism. A member of the congregation, an older member of the congregation, got up to pray the prayers of God's people. And I mean, there was this tender moment talking about God's heart for justice and the cares of the social ills that needed to be addressed by the church. And so this is when Jeff starts to kind of elbow me, like, are you listening to this? And then a denominational leader, Pastor Danny Martinez, our Central Conference Superintendent, he was the guest preacher that Sunday, and he got up and started talking about church planting. I'm not making this up, right? God is very obvious with me sometimes. Um, and my husband was like, by then he was just like, are you serious? Like, this is clearly where we're supposed to be. And that was God's way of confirming for me this next step on the church planting journey. You see, sometimes when we um, feel God calling us to do something unexpected, we need God to be very, very clear 
about those steps. And that's what we have in this chapter in the book of Acts. You see, in Acts 1.8, Jesus gave the thesis statement of the book of Acts. This is Acts 1.8. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This was God's plan. Jesus told the disciples, this is your role, this is your task, be obedient in it. And then in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit arrives, causing the disciples to be witnesses of Jesus in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and now at Acts 10, we're getting to the ends of the earth portion of the story. So the Holy Spirit is leading the early church to break down walls of hostility. It began with the tearing of the temple curtain in Luke 24, verse 35, when Jesus died on the cross that symbolically separated the people of God from the Holy of Holies, where God's presence dwelt. And now the Spirit is pushing them onward to continue breaking down walls that separate people from one another. God is calling them to love God and love other people, even people that they probably don't want to love very much. And that brings us to Acts chapter 10. God asked Peter to do the unexpected, to bring the gospel, the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, to his enemy. The question is, would Peter bring this person the gift of the good news of Jesus? Would he be willing to embrace him as a brother and include him as an equal in the uh, as an equal member in Christian community? And then the question follows, are we willing to risk being in real relationship with people we find unclean or impure? Because this is the question before Peter in Acts chapter 10. So God has asked Peter to do something unexpected, and because this is a stretch, this question is taking Peter outside of his comfort zone, God chooses to be very clear about the specifics. So I want to begin with a story of two visions. There are two visions in Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 begins with a man named Cornelius. He's a military leader for the Roman Empire, the sworn enemies of the Jewish people in this time period. But Cornelius was a God-fearer. He respected the God of Israel. He was a non-Jew who worshipped the God of Israel. He was a Gentile. And he was a military commander for the Roman Empire, the oppressive regime that occupied Israel in the first century. This puts him in a tricky territory as far as Peter's concerned. This is not somebody Peter is inviting over for dinner. But one day, Cornelius was praying to the God of Israel, and he had a vision of an angel who told him that God had noticed his prayers and his generosity. So the angel in this vision told him to send a group of people to get a man named Peter in the city of Joppa and to bring him back to Cornelius' house. So this is vision number one. Meanwhile, Peter is minding his own business, hanging out on a rooftop, waiting for lunch. That's what he's doing. He, and while he's there, he's praying to God and he's hungry. I mean, I think we've all been there, right? You're waiting for lunch, you're hungry. And while he's in this place, he's talking to God and he has this vision of a sheet that descends from heaven and it's filled with all kinds of animals and a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Now, Peter is a very good Jewish boy. He knows that there are things he's allowed to eat and there are things he is not allowed to eat. And this sheet is full of things he is not allowed to eat. So he replies, surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Now listen to what he hears from this voice from heaven. The voice says, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. 
this vision repeated three times just to make sure Peter got it, okay? And Peter is still pondering this when Cornelius' men show up downstairs at the house where Peter is staying. And the Holy Spirit said to Peter, these men are looking for you. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. So the men explained to Peter why they were there, and Peter agreed to go with them to Caesarea, where Cornelius lived. And we're told that some members of the early church went with Peter. So he has some friends with him. So now God continues this story of asking Peter to do the unexpected and takes him to Cornelius' house. And this brings us to the second point, which is two speeches. So we've had two visions, now we have two speeches. So Peter arrives at Cornelius' house. Cornelius has invited all of his friends and family to attend with him to hear what Peter has to say. And so when Peter gets there, there's a room full of people all eager to hear what he has to say. And so Peter begins with his speech. He says, you are all well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or even visit a Gentile. He's telling a group of Gentiles. It's against my law to come and sit with all of you and to talk with all of you. He says, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? So in reply, Cornelius offers his own speech. He says, I had this vision of an angel that told me to send for you. And then he ends by saying, now here we all are in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Peter replies, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Peter is offering, he's already told them, I'm not allowed to hang out with you guys. But now he says, God is teaching me something unexpected and new. And now I know that I have um, the authority of God, or God has given me permission to be here with all of you because you fear God and do what is right. Then he preached the good news of real peace in Jesus, who is Lord of all. Remember, he's speaking to a military commander of the Roman Empire whose job it was to enforce peace by oppressing the Jews. And in reply, Peter is saying, I am here to tell you about Jesus who was crucified by the Roman Empire, but he came to bring real peace. Do you understand this dynamic that's happening here? These two people groups that are in conflict with one another, and Peter here is telling them about the good news of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And then we're told, while Peter was still speaking, he's still explaining these ideas, the Holy Spirit broke out in the room, came on everyone who heard Peter's message. It's like the Holy Spirit couldn't contain itself and had to interrupt. Okay, so I'm going to read to you from Acts, the passage from today, 1044 through 48. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. I want you to imagine this. What is this like? The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. God has asked Peter to do the unexpected. He's invited him to go to the house of his enemy and tell him about Jesus. Verse 45 tells us that the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on Gentiles. You see, sometimes the Holy Spirit surprises us. Sometimes God asks us to do the unexpected, and when we're obedient, the Holy Spirit breaks out, shows up, and overwhelms us with the confirmation of God. 
And Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of these being baptized. They've already received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he orders that all of them get baptized. Now Acts 11 goes on um, because the word is getting out that Peter's out there teaching Gentiles about Jesus and asking that they be baptized. And this starts to ruffle some feathers and to raise some waves. And so Peter, when he returns to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers meet him and criticize him for going to Cornelius' house and eating with people gathered there because they were Gentiles. I want to pause here. Peter has been obeying the direction of God this entire time. He had a vision. He obeyed the vision. He heard a voice from heaven. He obeyed the voice of heaven. But when he goes back to his friends, they start getting after him because he is doing something unexpected, right? How will Peter respond to this? Peter told them the entire story of what had happened. He left nothing out. He made sure to explain the Holy Spirit showed up. And he said, if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? I love this about Peter. Peter's like, you're coming at me because I'm hanging out with the wrong people, but I am here to tell you I was being obedient to God. Who am I to stand in the Lord's way? If this is what God wants to do, then God's going to do it, and I'm going to be part of it. All right, friends, would we do the same? These are good questions. Twice in this section, we are told about the reaction of the circumcised believers to Peter's interaction with Cornelius and his family. It was a big deal for Peter to go to a Gentile's house, period. It was a big deal for Peter to share a meal with people who were considered unclean and impure. It was a big deal deal for Peter to offer the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a group of people who were trying to kill and oppress his people group. Follow that. Think about that. And some of his friends were not okay with him doing this. Now we're told that Cornelius was a God-fearer who practiced generosity and devotion to God and regular prayer but he would have been uncircumcised. He was a Gentile. So Gentiles, like Cornelius, could become Jewish, but he would have had to go through circumcision. The cultural religious expectation of Jewish Christians at this time was that Gentiles would need to be circumcised and become Jewish in order to follow Jesus. But the Holy Spirit jumped ahead, all right? The Holy Spirit poured out as the story of Jesus was told. The Holy Spirit didn't put any qualifications on the people answering the call of God. All right. Sometimes we get too focused on our cultural, religious expectations. We place expectations on how people need to look, sound, act, and dress before they can participate in the life of the church. Anybody seen that before? We layer cultural religious expectations on top of the good news of Jesus Christ. Peter recognized the movement of the Holy Spirit in the lives of Cornelius, his friends, and his family. And he may have walked into that room thinking, I do not want to do this. Let's be honest. There was probably part of Peter that said, I don't know that I want these people to have the good news. Okay? But God sent him, and so he did it. He may have been kicking and screaming. He may have been laughing at God and falling off of his couch and letting the laundry scatter because this is not what he wanted to do. But God called him, and he was obedient. Okay. Peter recognized what God was up to. He did not give them a list of changes they needed to make in the way they dressed, spoke, or acted. Instead, he recognized the Holy Spirit had already received them, and so he called for them to receive the confirmation of baptism. Bless him. Now, a word about baptism. It's a ceremony that marks an entrance to a community of people. 
It's a symbol that points to our rebirth in the salvation of Jesus. It represents the death of a former way of life and a rebirth into a new way of living. It's a way of showing that you are willing to enter into the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's a way of embodying your willingness to follow Jesus no matter how unexpected God's call on your life turns out to be. Now, circumcision was only offered to Jewish men. This is just an aside. Christian baptism is available to everyone. When Cornelius was baptized, his entire household was baptized. All right, Roman military commander, large family, large household, lots of people living in his house, doing the work of his house that were not his family members. Guess what? All of them got baptized. Baptism was a confirmation that Cornelius and his household believed in Jesus. They were all forgiven of their sin through the name of Jesus and had received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jewish Christians were surprised that the Holy Spirit acted in this way. They may have wished that maybe the Holy Spirit would not act in this way on this particular occasion, but they didn't get a say in that. They were shocked, but Peter said, and the others agreed, who are we to argue with what God is doing. God is breaking down walls of hostility. God's spirit is removing layers of cultural, religious expectation. And God is pouring out on new believers, insiders and outsiders alike. The Holy Spirit is moving in the life of the early church to embrace as equal brothers and sisters the kinds, the very kinds of people that they formerly would have considered impure or unclean, even the people who were trying to oppress them and ruin their lives because they were their enemies. You see, sometimes we don't get to choose our brothers and sisters in the church. Amen? Sometimes the Holy Spirit does it for us. All right. I'm going to break now. In our church, we do this every week. We call it our group chat. And I'm going to give you a couple of questions to talk about amongst yourselves. So split up into groups of, I don't know, three to four people. But here are the two questions. I'm going to give you a few minutes to discuss these, and then I will try to wrangle you back together and wrap it up. But here are the two questions. What was so surprising about the Holy Spirit pouring out on Cornelius and his household? Why was this unexpected? Why was Peter maybe a little reluctant to go to this house? Number two, and this is the painful one. What are some cultural, religious expectations we tend to layer on top of faith in Jesus? Who are we surprised when the Holy Spirit gets poured out on them and we're like, I'm not so sure about that, Jesus. I'm not sure I want to be in community with that group of people. All right, have fun. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to discuss these, and then I'll come back up and get your attention in a few minutes. Go ahead and break.
guys, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. for these two questions. Um, I hope that you all had a good time talking about the surprising work of the Holy Spirit. What led the Holy Spirit to break out on this community? And I hope that you had an honest conversation about the cultural religious practices and expectations that we tend to place on other people. I think that's something the church needs to dig into and to learn about and be honest about. This morning, we talked about sometimes when God invites us or asks us to do the unexpected and our need for God to give us really clear direction when that happens. In this story, God sent two visions to two different people in order to bring them together because God knew that these two people did not necessarily want to have anything in common with one another, right? God had to grease the wheels of this relationship. God sent a vision to Peter to get him ready to meet Cornelius, and God sent a vision to Cornelius to tell him to send for Peter. Um, just like God subtle hints to me about uh, by sending me a book about church planning, and a worship service that met every single point on our checklist about a church we were looking for, God has a way of making sure we get the message, especially when we might be reluctant or unsure about receiving it. In this story, you can hear the hesitation in the two speeches of Peter and Cornelius. They're both a bit unsure about what this means for their cultural religious expectations but each of them were obedient to God's unexpected call. And, when, and then the Holy Spirit broke out to confirm the activity of God. The Holy Spirit led the way, breaking down walls of hostility that divided people from God and from one another. Part of what needed to be demolished were these cultural religious expectations that had been layered on top of faith in God. God called Peter outside of his comfort zone to the doorstep of his enemy, a Roman centurion. Would Peter bring him the good news of Jesus? Would he be willing to embrace him as a brother and the hard work of building Christian community? The Holy Spirit challenges us in the same way to break down walls of hostility that divide our neighbors from God and from one another. Are we willing to dismantle cultural religious expectations that we have layered on top of faith in Jesus? Are we willing to offer the gospel freely, even to our enemy? Are we willing to risk new relationships with people we formerly would have considered unclean or impure? Are we willing, friends, to embrace our enemies as equal members of our church community? These are good questions. I hope we learn from the activity of the Holy Spirit, from the faithfulness of Peter, from the courage of Cornelius to embrace the unknown and step into these relationships because the work of God was clearly in it. I'm going to pray for us and then we'll continue in worship. God, you have called us to be uncomfortable, to step into relationships that we really honestly want no part of. Lord, you have gone before us in breaking down these walls of hostility between us and God and between us and other people. Teach us to be obedient to your call. Confirm your call in our life when we're reluctant or hesitant. 
Teach us to be willing to follow you, Lord, because that's the work of a disciple, to follow Jesus. Let it be so in our own lives.